Welcome to episode 79 of the Camerosity Podcast, the world's number one open source film photography podcast. My name is Mike Ekman, and we are back with another episode. Tonight's topic comes right off the top of the Camerosity suggestion box. For the past couple of weeks, we've received requests to talk about medium format SLRs, the Mamiya RB67, Pentax 67, Bronicas, and other large cameras. So if big SLRs is your forte, then this is the episode for you. Before we get things going, let's do some introductions. Starting us off from Sydney, Australia, is Theo Panagopoulos, who is pretty disappointed tonight because his beloved Mamiya 7 can't be classified as an SLR. Hey Theo, do you think he'll be able to make it through the night? I think I will be able to. The reason I'm disappointed that it's not an SLR is because we can't spend the night talking about it, not because it's not an SLR, because remember, it's the perfect camera. And we can't talk about it through the night because my liver wouldn't be able to handle that either. <laughs> Next, from Gainesville, Florida, is our favorite Hasselblad enthusiast, Anthony Root. Hey, Anthony, what is it that you love so much about Victor Hasselblad's wonderful camera? I like the fact that during a hurricane, you can use it to like hold down the tarp over your roof after your roof gets blown off. Finally, from Yellow Springs, Ohio, is Paul Reibel, someone who has sold more medium format SLRs than anyone here. Hey, Paul, what is the most popular camera you've ever sold? I think that would have to be the Hasselblad. <laughs> He's been muted. The hustle burger. <laughs> All right. Well, we got a pretty big uh, waiting room. There's a few uh, familiar faces in there. So let me let everybody in. All right. We have some returning callers. We got a few new faces. Uh, I'll start with the names I don't recognize. And I apologize if you have been here before, but my memory sucks. Let's see here. All right. Robert W. I, yes. I'm not going to try and pronounce your last name. So uh, welcome, Robert. Yeah. I usually also don't dare to try to correctly pronounce my name. Um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm Robert. Um, I am first time caller, long time listener, um, calling in from from Austria, from Vienna. And yeah, I was the one of the people that suggested let's talk about Bronicas. And I thought that yeah, I might great. join in because this was in the title. Awesome. All right, Fernando, we have another European caller. These guys are, are troopers. Hey, Fernando. Fernando from Nuremberg in Germany. I have a nice collection of old Soviet SLRs and many others. <laughs> what are you holding there in your hand? This is a yep six six C. I oh, know sixty. You're gonna you're gonna build up some arm muscles one handing both of those. Those are big heavy cameras. Uh, Andrew Wells, welcome to the show, Andrew. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm a long time listener, first time caller. Long time listener, first time caller. All right. I my brother introduced me to this podcast. Actually, I'm a college student in Tennessee. And uh, I heard it was medium format SLR, so I just I knew how to show up to this one. I was excited <laughs> about it. That's it was a popular topic, so we're glad to 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 get through it. So, uh, Tom Zoss, uh, you joined us at the Bloomington Photography Club. Any of you who have a photo club, our host makes a great guest visitor fountain of information. Yeah, I, I called into what's the name of your photo group, Tom? Bloomington, Indiana Photography Club. Although I've recently moved, I'm in. Chevy Chase, Maryland, right outside of Washington okay. right now. Tom, I was, I was born and raised in Bloomington. My family goes back there four generations. All right. Looks like we have Henry Blanton. Henry, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Uh, yeah, it's the uh, first time uh, calling in. Where are you calling from? Uh, I'm from Lubbock, Texas. Okay. Uh, it's in the panhandle. But yeah, I just started listening to the podcast a few months ago and thought this sounded like an interesting episode to join on. Awesome. Andrew, you said your brother introduced you to the show. Is it somebody we know or just, just a, another longtime listener? Uh, he's a longtime listener, but I think uh, you guys interacted with him once. He asked a question during the AMA episode. He was the one who asked all of y'all's favorite cameras. Okay. All right. I just if didn't you know remember so that, that's, yeah, it's way back. Okay, cool. All right. Well, in addition to our, um, our large number of first-time callers, which is awesome because we love new people, uh, we have Will Pinkham, we have AJ back, we have Miles back. Um, of course, our beloved hosts. Am I missing anybody who's not on video? Brian Zeman. Brian, are you there? No. All right. Well, as is obvious, I am now... here. Can you hear oh, me? Okay. Hey, Brian. Sorry. All right. You want to quickly what? introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, long time listener, second time um, coming on the show here, actually. Uh, I was excited when I saw you guys were going to be talking about Veronica's uh, system. I'm a big fan of the ETR and ETRSIs. I mean, I don't really know. We don't have the, the great thing about episodes that you guys suggest is that, you know, it's kind of wide open. Uh, it does sound like Bronica's are trying to take in the lead here. 
I have two Bronicas. The only one that I have any experience with is the S2. And I was enamored with that camera for, for two reasons. One, I just love, it reminds me of an old like classic automobile with a whole bunch of polished shiny chrome. Uh, it's a very attractive camera. And I also love that back then they would use Nikkor lenses. So um, we've covered Nikon quite extensively on the show. And as pretty much everybody knows, Nikon is one of the few companies to never truly dabble in medium format. But that doesn't mean you can't get medium format cameras with Nikon lenses. The Bronica system had them. Uh, there were a number of TLRs that would, would have um, Nikkor lenses too. Aries made one that had Nikkor lenses. There's a few other options too. So uh, the Bronica is certainly a compelling option. And there is a, I don't know if you want to call it a hack or a popular mod uh, that people tend to do with some of those uh, that we'll probably get to in a little bit here too that kind of make that system compelling too. What, what other Bronica do you have? It's the GS1. Okay. The GS1. Right, right, yeah. So this one, and the reason I haven't shot it is I have four lenses for it. And I feel like if I'm going to spend some time with it, I want to go through the whole system. You know, as it sits here on my display, it's got the 50 millimeter wide angle lens on it. I think there's one wider than this. Um, but I want to actually spend some time with this camera and try out the different lenses for it. And I just, I never can find the time. So it's sort of sat here collecting dust, but one of these days I'm going to actually devote some real time to this thing and really spend some time with it. Cause I, I do really like it. I mean, it feels, feels very nice. Me personally, I tend to favor waist level finders on medium format cameras. I, I do sometimes struggle with the eye level prisms on some of these things. For me, it feels like I'm kind of holding like a square bowling ball to my face. When, when you use these things to the eye. But, you know, I know to some people, they do prefer that. But it does feel like a very robust system. And unlike my S2, which has some focus problems, uh, this one appears to be in perfect working order. So, Mike, if I can just sort of get this out of the way quickly. Sure. When we when, when we announced this topic, I, I just assumed that we were going to be overwhelmingly dominated by people wanting to talk about the Mamiya RB67 mm. and uh, perhaps the Pentax 67. And it warms my my cold heart to to hear all the people that want to talk about the Pentacons and the Bronicas yeah. and the things other than the cameras that just get talked to death on uh, YouTube and on the other on the other podcasts. I, I feel the same way. I mean, I, I don't know. There's much we could say about the Pentax six seven that hasn't been said a bazillion times. You know, the RB sixty seven. Those are those are classic cameras. They're great. I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. They are fine shooters. But um, one message that I hope anybody either here now or listening to this show later on gets is that those aren't the only options. Um, in fact, similar to discussions we've had about like the Canon AE-1 or even the Pentax K-1000 when it comes to 35 millimeter SLRs, those are both extremely popular cameras and for good reason, they're good cameras, but due to their popularity, the prices are often, you know, hyperinflated, at least compared to other options that are out there. So, at the very beginning of the show, Fernando showed us his Soviet SLRs. And um, I know you get some of those things serviced and, and they're just as good as anything else out there. The lens, the glass that those things have. Fernando, have you shot yours or do you just collect them? Oh, I have shot a lot. Yes. I have a very big uh, um, collection of lenses too. Okay. And I have one very interesting adapter in which you can adapt the Kiev uh, screw. Uh, medium format into this um, uh, other Kiev non-screw with is similar to Canon that you just turn. Is that uh, is that the one that a rot makes? This one you, you turn. Yeah. Yep. Because it does the conversion. So he's showing. He just showed us. He's holding up the body of the camera, and it's like a quick release bayonet, real fast mount and dismount on it. Looks like. So that's something that I've always been kind of interested in too, Paul, is that Arat company who would take some of the older Soviet cameras and like upgrade them, right? Yeah, in Ukraine, yes. In Ukraine, yeah. Are they still s selling them? I mean, I've heard things that some of the supplies have dried up. They, I think they are not in business anymore. But uh, what I do buy in Ukraine today is film, <laughs> a lot of film. Now, your Kievs, have you had them serviced? No, no, I no. do. I, I, I am a, also a, a, as a hobby, a mechanic. I okay. am an engineer. So I am being specialized learning uh, rolly flexes. And uh, most of the mechanicals are not problem for me. 
I know Kupal uh, Geja Dene does a lot of work with the Kievs and the Pentagon Sixes. I interviewed him several years ago, and he says he actually quite likes working on those cameras because when they when they are serviced and properly lubricated, um, he he glowed, you know, about how how nice of shooters they can be. You know, it's just with anything though. You know, they've, they if they haven't been serviced, if they've been, you know, what are they? What, what's that saying? Uh, worked hard and put away wet or whatever. You know, fifty years of of use and and anything's going to wear out. And sometimes those cameras saw a lot of a lot of use over the years and. If you could just, you know, pick up one on eBay and it's locked up, you know, maybe they're not as ideal, but get one serviced and they're great. I just want to uh, chime in here real quick. Actually, it's uh, A-R-A-X is an X-ray. Oh, uh, X. I just went on there. Yeah, not a T, but X. Um, Their website says that they are continuing to work during this challenging time. Thank you for supporting us. Uh, so maybe they're still doing uh, the conversions and selling stuff. It's Arax Photo, photo with an F dot com. Yeah, they, they were selling a lot of adapters and uh, uh, custom. They were sort of like the SK Grimes of Europe. I mean, they, they would make they would make an adapter to fit a lot of uh, unusual things. I was just going to chime in. I actually got this service by Arax uh, last December. So uh, as far as I know, they're still. What is it? Uh, this is the Kiev 88. Um, with the Pentagon six mount. Uh, yeah, I had bought a broken one and I sent it over there. It took about two months, two or three months to get sent back, but yeah, it works well now. And I got it, the paint redone on the edges. So, well, wow. is that the one they call the Hasselblodsky? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> are, they, are they still doing it now? Are they? Uh, yeah, this was last, uh, I think I sent it off in December and I think I got it back around March. So, most of the time was just getting it shipped over there, and the service was actually pretty quick. I was gonna say, because I've got a Kiev 88, which I bought actually when I was working in, in Moscow, and I think I managed to get one roll of film through it before it broke, and then got it fixed, and then it broke again. And um, it might be, you know, it might be time to just sort of try, stop trying to avoid keeping it uh, original and just ship it over to these guys to do their magic. <laughs> And there isn't the problem with one of these cameras that you really have to um, take care in which order you adjust uh, shutter speed yeah. and uh, aperture and stuff before you shoot it. Otherwise, you will break all the mechanisms inside. Yeah. yeah so both of them were broken. I sent two actually to get fixed. Um, and I shot with one for a couple of weeks. And then I did exactly what you're not supposed to do. So <laughs> now this one is kind of sitting on the shelf. I don't pull it out too often but <laughs> is, it this, is it the same problem that you you always make sure the shutter is cocked before you change correct the shutters yeah it looks like on their website that Arax has the ability to, to buy a a body that's been completely overdone uh overall with uh some added features for 485 now that does not come with lens and it looks like you're going to need to put on either a a viewfinder but it, the basic body itself is only 45, which is not a bad price at all. Henry, you said you had yours converted to have the Pentagon 6 mount. Now, I've heard of that conversion, but I don't know what the benefit of it is. Is it just a, a wider selection of lenses? Uh, this one actually already had the Pentagon 6 mount. The only thing I had a, like extra added to it was the mirror lockup. They switched over to Pentagon 6 at some point, um, you know, when they were still being originally produced. I got gotcha. um, but actually, only reason I chose this in particular is I already had a Pentagon 6, and uh, I had, like, the fisheye for that and everything, so I wanted to keep using that that lens system. Yeah, I mean, I apologize for the basic question. I'm just not familiar enough with that system at all. It's it's very confusing, Mike. The, yeah. Uh, because the, the lens mounts are not – I can't look at a lens and identify what the mount is. I mean, the P6 I can pretty much figure out, but they make several other mounts, too, that – that are not interchangeable, so it gets confusing. We we're talking about for for a first time buyer uh, who wants to get into medium format SLRs. The Russian cameras are are, are a decent starting place, but you don't have as much of a, a you don't get a great selection in the U.S. There's just not as many of them, and not as many that work. But on the other hand, a good entry level camera would be a, either a Bronica or a Kawa. Both can have problems, but they can both be repaired. And there are quite a few of them available. It depends on the Bronica, right? So I have an ETRS, and everybody said that basically if. No, the mechanicals. The the uh, yeah. the early ones were the Z and the D, I believe, were the first Bronicas. And they were copies of the uh, Hasselblad 1000. And they were they had a lot of features. They were actually really nice cameras. But like 
like the camera they copied, they were problematic. Uh, so then they changed to the Bronica S, which was their first of the S series. And they took features off the camera, actually. It had a non-removable lens mount. The, the uh, uh, sleeve, the helicoid was not removable on the camera. So you were somewhat limited on the lenses that it would accept. It was it was not not a bad camera. It was actually the first SLR, medium format SLR I owned. And uh, it was dropped down a flight of concrete stairs. The back flew off halfway down the stairs. The finder popped up and it landed on the finder, which crushed it. But the camera worked perfectly uh, for another few years. So when they changed to the S2 Bronica, they uh, moved to a lens uh, helicoid that was removable. So they would still accept lenses from 40 millimeter up to, I think, 150. Uh, and then there were some long telephoto lenses that had their own helicoid that moved in the place of that one. The nice thing about the Bronicas were that they, the mirrors on Bronicas slide down rather than up. And it's an instant return mirror, which is good too. Um, so you can use, it's, it's fairly easy to adapt other lenses to it, lenses that normally you would not be able to put onto a medium format SLR. Uh, the Bronicas can be adapted to them pretty, pretty easily. And so, you know, you had the Bronica, the S2, the S2A, and then after the S2A, they went into the electronic cameras, the ETRS, the GS1, the SQ which were excellent cameras, but like all electronic cameras, they, they're they beginning to fail. Uh, and it's getting pretty problematic to find parts, especially for ETRs. But, you know, as far as the image quality, the image quality was excellent on any of those. Mike, you've been shooting the Kawa. What did you think of it? You had recommended it to me and talked about how bright the viewfinder was and you thought that I really like it. And you're absolutely right. So basically, the, it's the Kawa 6. I have the 85 2.8 on it right now. And um, the one thing that's r different about it than like a Hasselblad is it doesn't have the magazine back. It's just like a more traditional, just regular roll film back. So it, it makes it shorter front to back, but maybe a little bit taller. What I like about it is most of the medium format SLRs that I've used with all the dark slides and there's always interlocks and just different things. Like you, you generally have to spend a little bit of time familiarizing yourself with the camera, you know, and especially if you have multiples where you're kind of bouncing back and forth between them. You have to remember the right order. We, you know, we had mentioned the Soviet cameras require things be done in a specific order. Um, and it's funny because Kawa had a 127 SLR that is notorious for being fragile and falling apart if you do things in the wrong order. So there's sort of a, a, a caveat to shooting these cameras where you RTFM before you use it. This camera, I didn't need to do that. I mean, I picked it up. I don't have the manual. Yeah, I could have went to Mike Buckets to site and looked it up. But I was able to load this thing, pick it up, shoot it. I made it through an entire roll of 220. So it's both 120 and 220. Switching it between the two was, was obvious how to do it. And I really like that about the camera is that it, it seemed to me like everything on it was very intuitive. I didn't have to mess around with you know the different options. Uh, one, of, one of Kurt's Hasselblad's that you got, Paul, that was a 203 FE. That mm -hmm. camera has has a focal plane shutter, but then it also had the lens on it with the leaf shutter. And I, I remember before I sent it to you, I was messing around with it. And like you had to do something to switch back and forth between shutters, sometimes taking the lenses off. The camera has to be in a certain mode. The mirror has to be up or down. And it, it just felt like so overwhelming to me. You have to make sure the two dots on the magazine and the body are, are both red. Uh, otherwise, like the shutter and something's not synchronized and something it just felt so overly complicated. Perhaps that's one of the reasons Anthony, it, you know, hasn't really attracted himself to the Hasselblads too. But uh, in terms of the Kawa 6, I don't know who the target market for this would have been when it was new, but I have to imagine beginners or at least people who maybe didn't need all the complexity of, of some of the, the more higher end cameras. But for what it is, it works really, really well. Uh, like I said, I, I'd never even picked up one of these before. I was able to load it up. I didn't have any issues with it. I didn't have any missed frames, or at least I don't think I did. I haven't developed the role yet. I, I literally finished it today. But I, I just felt really impressed with how simple, and it just felt like the designer of this camera knew how it was supposed to work and made it in a way that you don't have to RTFM uh, before using this camera. So I'll certainly give you guys additional feedback once I develop the images I got from it. But um, color me impressed. I, I think that camera's a winner so far. The market for it, I think, really was the 
advanced amateur. Okay. Um, it, I mean, it could be a wedding camera because it's a leaf shutter. So, mm-hmm. you know, guys like it to sync with flash at all sure. speeds. So, I mean, that's an advantage. But they, they went to the Kawa 66, which was a two versions past that one. And the 66 did have interchangeable magazines. And it's the goofiest system I've ever seen. I still don't know how it works. There is no removable dark slide. When you take the back off, somehow or other, it triggers something that moves the dark slide into place so you don't fog the film. And I, I can't. And then when you put it back on, it takes it out of the way. Hmm. So, and you can't see it because it doesn't go away until you put it on the camera. Yeah. So there's no there's no way to know where it goes somewhere, but I don't know where. <laughs> it's I've got a question about the Kawa Six. I've always kind of liked the looks of them, but I've been a little bit shy because I'd read a few different places that they were sometimes a little finicky with having trouble with the shutters on them going out. Same with like the Kiev eighty eight. So I've kind of shied away from them. Have has anybody here ever heard about um, the Kawa Sixes having trouble with the shutter for reliability? Yeah, I have a good friend uh, who is a specialized mechanic in Kawa Six in Spain. Alex Alex Varas uh, is great uh, mechanical for uh, all kinds of SLRs on TLR in Spain. Well, and it's a it's a shutter in the lens, so it's a leaf shutter. So yeah. every time you replace the lens, it's a different shutter. So. I don't know if oh, that okay. th- that doesn't really answer your question because they could still be finicky. Well, at least, yeah, it, you just replace the lens. Yeah, the, the ETR is like that, too. So it's like, well, if the, the shutter goes out, um, then you just get a different lens. Yeah, I didn't know that the shutter was in the lens on the Kawas. So yeah, I don't no, have to give those shutter. a second glance. I don't think there's a lot of trouble with the shutters. I think the problem is mechanics. Um, it's Jeremy Mudd, I had hoped he'd be able to join us tonight because Jeremy is a a long time user of the Kawa cameras and, and has a, I think he still has a complete system. He has a, a really good blog. It's Jeremy Mudd, M U D D dot com, I believe is the, uh, is his blog. But he's reviewed uh, the, the Kawas at, uh, and also Bronica. He's a Bronica shooter as well. But, but you know, the nice thing is that it, it is a, a, a mechanical camera. So unless you need parts, it, it should be possible to get them repaired for, for, the foreseeable future, unlike a Bronica ETRS that would need a circuit board that, uh, you know, you just don't have access to. I mean, take off the lens and this literally is just a box. I mean, there's very little to go wrong with it because it doesn't have the the back. It doesn't rely on a dark slide. There's not all the linkages that a lot of the more complicated cameras have that can still have problems. So I would assume that anybody who can fix or repair a mechanical camera should be able to handle the body fine. The lens, I don't know much about the internal design of these, but I suspect that anybody who can repair a, a leaf shutter lens, you know, Hasselblad or whoever else makes it, probably can service the lenses too. So while the Kawa 6 may not be the most common or popular of these cameras, I suspect they're no harder to repair than, than other ones, you know. So the options for getting one in good working shape um, are probably pretty high. In the last episode, we established that AJ is our eBay secretary. So AJ, are you looking up prices for the Kawa 6? What do, what do they go for? Can you check for us? Am I justified in recommending this as a cost-effective alternative to some of the more popular models out there? What I got over here in Canadian is between, I'd say, 650 to about $350. Okay. Yeah. So that's probably that's about an American... It. Sorry. Yeah, in the in the US they'll they will sell a kit, a six kit with a lens and good working order will sell for around four hundred dollars. So that's that's not out of line at all. And there there are a lot of lenses available. You'll pay eight hundred bucks for a broken Hasselblad five hundred. Uh, yeah. Easy. Or non non service. So I mean you're talking in, in good shape. Yeah, I'd say this is I'm not saying it's the best option or the only option because there's certain certainly plenty of no. them. But so far the Koa six gets a thumbs up from me. And of course, the Calamar Reflex. Calamar Reflex, yes. Yeah. What's funny is I shot the, the Fujita. We had a listener on that just, no, it was Dan Cooney, just did the Calamar 60 or something, which was a later version of that. It, it seems like that camera has had an uptick in popularity too. Does, the Calamar, I think, is a copy of the Fujita 66. It is. It? it is, yeah. Yeah. They stopped selling it, and then Calamar ex- exclusively was selling it into, I want to say till like 61 or 62, whereas I think Fujita 
stop selling them in Japan in like 59 or 60. So Calamar continued to sell those even after they weren't available in Japan anymore. So in the U.S., they're, they're I don't want to say easy, but they're not difficult to find here. And the advantage, of course, is you're working with 120 film. You were talking about sure. the Comaflex earlier, which is 127. Yeah, that was it. Yep. Yeah, Comaflex S. It's one of the neatest cameras, but also one of the most problematic cameras. It is, yeah. And I had a perfect, perfect copy of it that was in storage for a while. And I took it out recently. I was like super excited. I was just like, oh, I just want to like, you know, fire it. And I totally yeah. didn't remember the fact of the sequence, the things you have to do. I think I screwed it up. So <laughs> I don't know. I've yeah. got to put it aside. I'm just holding my breath that it will fix it. I've itself. heard that about that model. And I, I assume that Kawa learned from their mistakes and avoided them with this one. Cause I, like I said, I've had no issue with it. Cock the shutter, change the shutter speed. I mean, really changing the shutter speed and um, the aperture is done with two rings on the lens itself. No different than a, a 35 millimeter SLR is, you know, you advance the knob to drop the mirror and it's just ready to go. Like it doesn't really matter whatever you do it in. I really like those cameras too, because he, he had a lot of them. You got one. I think I got five or six others. Oh, wow. Yeah, I only had one, but this one was in the original blue box in, in mm. excellent shape. So maybe I took the took the best one. Maybe I don't know. I don't even remember seeing more than one, to be honest with you. So much time has passed. So t Tom Zoss, what are you, are you? Are you shooting any medium format SLRs? Well, um, I have two graph flexes. Um, I shoot a, a, a six by nine, a um, two and a quarter, three and a quarter, a, a crown graphic. And I also have a custom-made one that uh, uses an XL body that's been remachined, and I have a, um, a super wide-angle lens on it. And those are the only two I shoot right now. I used to shoot with the the H word that uh, we aren't going to talk about tonight. <laughs> I'm um, sure we'll get to it. So it's, you go ahead and you, go ahead and, you can go ahead if you want to, because I'll follow, I'm sure I won't be able to resist. It's all right, but um, and, and then I have a couple of others. Um, I, I have a medium format here that I talked about. Um, uh, it's an Kodak 620 Duo. I don't know if any of you guys, it uses 620 or 120, but um, it's a half frame camera. The way it does half frames is on the back, it has two different windows. So you mm -hmm. shoot with number one in the first window, and then you wind number one to the second window and shoot the other half of the frame. And then you go on to two and three. That camera dates back to like 60, or I'm sorry, 34, 35, before it was common for manufacturers to put the 16 exposure numbers on the backing paper. So it uses it uses the eight exposure numbers for it, and you just use it twice. I think those are vastly underrated cameras. They're Nagel cameras. They're fantastic. They, they, they produce fantastic results. Mm -hmm. They're kind of under the radar. They're very affordable. It's a German camera. I mean, it's not an SLR, but for somebody that's like coming into shooting medium format, they're, sure. they're a real value. Right. I described it in my review as that camera, the Kodak Duo 6, 620. It's, it's a medium format retina, and that's exactly what it is. It's made by Nagel. It's very similar. It's just a little bit larger, of course, because it's roll film. It's 620, uh, but as we've many, many times in this show said, respooling 120 to 620 is not an issue. Uh, but you're right. It's not an SLR. Has anybody here ever shot any of the stovepipe graph flexes, the big? I was actually just about to mention those. If we're going to talk about SLRs, we have to we have to go yeah. back to one of the originals. Because I have. about the RB or RD? The original are you RB. The RB or the RD, the SLR that. Uh, well, who's the guy in Washington that's always shooting Congress with the. the uh, Graham Burnett. Yeah. He's shooting an Aero Liberator. That's it, He's the Liberator. Shooting, yeah, that's the one that John Minnick does. Gotcha. Okay. That's right, isn't it, Anthony? Yeah, correct. He, he shoots one of one of John's cameras, and uh, you know you always see the the press photos of him out front with his Aero Liberator, and everybody else has their DSLRs, and uh, he takes fantastic photographs. So that's still sheet film, right? Correct. He's shooting four by five. So is it? I mean, is it wrong to just say that it's the same as a, a Crown Graphic or Speed Graphic, just with a reflex viewfinder, or is it more than that? I am not qualified to respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad Tom's hearing this because I was on the um, camera group discussion last week and um, I had to keep reminding them I, I have not shot every camera ever made. It may seem like it, 
but there are wide areas that I have no experience with, and any of those early SLRs are uh, are beyond my experience. So I guess we'll just stop talking about it. Do they have a mirror that sort of goes out of the way on those ones? I mean, I'm not that familiar with them. So if it does, regardless of whether it's sheet film or roll film, it is. It is yeah, it's a massive. It's a massive waist level viewfinder that you're looking down through. Yeah. So it is. It is an SLR. Yeah. By the by the by what that actually means. Paul's got one in his hands right now. I keep on trying to get Medic to come on the show. He lives about you know 15 minutes away from me, but uh, uh, he's out in the countryside and doesn't have a great connection to the internet, and uh, he's a little reticent to come on. But uh, visiting his workshop was fascinating because he's got like arrow liberators up on the, uh, or he's got um, uh, you know cameras in various stage of, of conversion up along the wall and prototypes he's working on. And all the arrow ectar lenses that weigh like 16 pounds on his workbench. Fascinating, fascinating guy. Great cameras that he works on. Yeah, this is a Graphflex RB. And it's not a 4x5. This one actually has a rollback on it. I believe it was 6x9 was the original film size on it. They're cool cameras. I mean, they it's got a little cover here for the uh, for the lens. And, you know, on, some, on most Graphflexes, there's a button you push to open stuff up. This one, you just run the focus out and it pops up the uh, little window uh it's a focal plane shutter i mean these were these were you know they were used for press photography uh primarily uh i suppose maybe some studios used them too but uh, this has a kodak ektar lens on it so so why would uh, someone use that over a traditional say four by five in that period well because it's an slr you, you'd have the ability to to do a close up if you wanted to, like a wedding photographer would want to do a ring shot or a flower shot or something like that, or a press photographer, or uh, you know a crime scene photographer. Uh, right. Being able to to do close ups is is quite handy. Close-ups, yeah, frame you know more accurate framing. The closest to that is a camera that I am working on a review for now that I have shot is the the Grayflex National Grayflex. This thing. When I first saw this, I assumed it was from the teens, maybe the 1920s. And I was surprised to learn that this camera didn't even come out till 34. It looks much older than it really is, but it folds shut. I mean, when it's shut, it just looks like a box, like an octagonal box. And it was sold by Fulmer. I don't think they were Fulmer Grayflex at the time. I can't remember because Grayflex was acquired by Kodak, then split up from Kodak at one point too. So yeah, Fulmer Grayflex Corporation, Rochester, New York. So this is an American camera. It's called the National Grayflex. There's two versions of it. Uh, they're both very similar. They have interchangeable lenses. You can actually remove the lens, but they only ever made one other lens for it. And what I love about this lens is even though it's branded branded a Grayflex lens made by Bausch & Lomb, this is a Zeiss Tessar, which back then, prior to the war, Carl Zeiss lenses as you know they remained throughout the 20th century were in high demand and there were more people who wanted zeiss lenses than they were capable of making so zeiss carl zeiss arranged certain agreements with different lens makers bausch and lam in the united states was one um i want to say cook in england was another maybe Anjanu, i'm not sure but at least a couple other companies zeiss actually gave the uh, the parameters for their lenses, for some of the more popular lenses, and licensed the the technology and the name and the, maybe the patents or something to these other companies so they would make them. So even though this is a Tessar and it's a Zeiss lens, it's made by Bausch & Lomb in the United States to Zeiss's specifications. I have um, one of my folding Kodaks has a, a Bausch & Lomb Zeiss Tessar on it too. So great lens. It's a focal plane shutter. I'm not even going to begin to explain to you the controls because there's all these weird knobs on it that are numbered. The shutter speeds are numbered like one through seven, and then there's no eight and then nine, which represent like the gap of the curtains. Um, It's 10 exposures. So it's basically like six by seven. I think officially it was two and a quarter by two and three quarters. But it's an SLR. I mean, this this is a true SLR reflex viewfinder. You're composing through the lens. There is a lever next to the viewfinder where you manually raise and lower the mirror. So I assume Paul, that other that larger gray flex probably works the same way. They wouldn't yeah. have coupled back then the the instant return mirror, or they didn't even have instant return mirrors. It wasn't coupled to the shutter release at all. 
that camera was also sold marketed as the ladies Graflex uh, because of the size. But yeah. what they didn't tell you was that changing the shutter speed and cocking the shutter on that thing, you had to have the strength of Andre the Giant to be able to move the thing. You could, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've strained my index finger trying to, trying to set the shutter speed. It just, they simply don't want to move. And if you do ever come across one of these, RTFM, they're out there. But you cannot fold the lens shut unless the mirror is up. So don't force it. So definitely not a beginner's camera. No, absolutely not. Um, in fact, although while I do believe this thing worked well, a combination of you know the person holding it and just the fact that it's a 90-year-old SLR, um, out of my first 10 exposures, I think like only five of them came out. So, But the fact that I got even a single image from it, I think is super cool. It was a lot of fun to shoot. And what is cool is it does give you that early 20th century SLR um, experience, but in a much smaller body. I mean, this is like, here's the Bronica I was showing you before compared to the Bronica. I mean, it's, I don't want to say a ton smaller, but it's, it's lighter. It's a lot more portable. And if you're into medium format cameras, but want something older, a little quirkier, or something different um, than the established ones, you have this one. And then I'll do one more show and tell and let someone else talk. Uh, here's another one. There you go. Okay. He's got uh, the exact 66. Um, I'll get to that in a second. But this is a German camera called the KW Reflex Box. This is a box camera that's also an SLR. It has a reflex mirror. It has the viewfinder where you look through the single lens through it. It's got three shutter speeds, 100, 50, 25. And it's one of those cameras where the mirror itself is the shutter can do timed bulb and instant it's got a little bubble level to make sure that it's level this particular one has a steinheil actinar 105 4.5 lens on it so this is a true slr2 it's called the kw reflex box and uh, this is kind of another fun probably a little bit easier to find than the national gray flex but these are two 1930s medium format slrs that meet our criteria Real quick, you said uh, your other Baronica was a GS, right? GS1, correct. Yeah, the one that felt like a bowling ball. I was wondering, have you ever seen or looked into getting one of the the winder grips for it? That's one of the things that really actually attracted me to the ETRs was the winder grips, because I just never really felt natural, kind of like you with that bowling ball to the face. But when I got the, the grip winder, it just felt a lot more ergonomic. And that's one of the things that I liked about it was it was something you could pop on, pop off. And all of the um, the, the ETRs are really, really um, modular. That's actually something I've really enjoyed about uh, shooting them. It's just like you can pretty much change anything on the camera and even um i know a lot of people are kind of shy with getting into something that's a little bit older that has electronics in it but even if the body uh craps out the bodies themselves actually if you watch ebay and pay attention you can get pretty much any part of the system for pretty reasonable but yeah before i go too far into the weeds yeah have you ever looked at getting one of the grips for the gs I haven't, but I absolutely believe that if I did have it, I probably would like it more. While these grips do tend to make large cameras even larger, I do think, though, that they they add a little bit better of a like a sure handed grip to it. And, uh, you know, we we said we wouldn't spend too much time on the Pentax 67, but that's why I really like the grip on this thing. I think by having a better handle on the camera, just sort of. I don't even know. Maybe it's a psychological thing. Maybe I'm just a big wimp. I don't know. On the Bronicas, they call them speed grips. And what they are is a thumb advance. Uh, so Yeah, I have one, I have one from, from here, if you. Yeah, he's got one. Looks really so. Yeah, so it has a shutter release on the grip itself and a thumb advance. It's very useful if you're using a prism. Okay, so Robert's got one. So you basically just attach the speed grip here. So you have here your winder. Okay, and so it attaches. You just slip, yeah, you basically just slip it over and then it locks in here. And okay. then you have the speed grip. I, I have to say and tap into Brian's comment um, for the ET, um, ETR and DTRS. Um, I think it's quite necessary to have the speed grip because it's a bit awkward um, as it is a 645 camera. And if you want to, to shoot portrait, for instance, it's very difficult to use a waist level, um, waist level viewfinder. But basically, what I prefer in this in this context is um, this this normal um, eye level viewfinder, and then it's really awkward to hold the camera without uh, yeah. without the speed grip, right? It really so is. 
if you if you don't have the speed grid, it's a fairly small camera. Um, I gotta say. Doesn't the handle interfere with advancing the film? The handle advances the film. Yeah, that you have you have a lever here where you basically. Just oh, appears. I see. Okay, I, that yeah. I was missing that. So it's got like a wine lever for your thumb, yeah. and that's I see. Yeah, and it also upgrades the camera to having a hot shoe. This is what the okay. ETRS doesn't have, and um, now it's really well. It, now it transforms it into a wedding photographer's camera. <laughs> the, the thing to remember, though, is that if you get one of those, <laughs> and you put it on the camera. Make sure that you put the wind crank somewhere where you know where it is. Yes. Oh, see, Plus, preferably you'll be in, spending about fifty to hundred dollars on eBay to buy another one. Even, if you can even get one, um, because they they get uh, you, you'd be amazed how many people lose those the first time they take it off. Uh, <laughs> you, and I put you mine on my parts bodies. I gotta say, I think it's even better to wind the camera without the. Um, so if you don't use the speed grip, I think yes. uh, it's even easier and less awkward to wind it without the lever. But they seem okay. to be, you know, equal to to gold in their weight. <laughs> you know, following up on Robert's camera, there it's something that I don't have enough experience in myself, but I'm really fascinated by this sort of flourishing in this. I guess it was maybe 80s, 90s. Of, of semi-pro 645 cameras. I mean, you've got the Contax, the Pentax, the Bronica, um, the Mamiya. Uh, it seems like there were like three or four others that were really nice cameras that were uh, introduced during that time. And they're kind of, again, it's another sort of category that, that, that's flown under the radar. Uh, now, obviously, the, 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 the Contax is still bloody expensive. Uh, Pentax is getting up there. Oh, the Baronicas are so cheap. The ETRs, yeah. that was another thing that got me into it. Like some of the other ones it, were just a lot pricier, but um, I got mine um, right before the pandemic and very reasonable price um, for them. They're just kind of a dark horse out there. I, and I'm not even sure why it is. The glass is nice. I've heard it supposedly uh, was made by Tamron. There's a wide selection of lenses. I've got everything from a 40 up to a 250. And they even had like a, a fisheye and a very variable zoom for it, um, extension tubes, um, teleconverters, um, all kinds of glass available uh, for the system. And there's even actually, I probably shouldn't say this, but there is adapters out there I've seen for micro four thirds. That seems to be what drives the prices of all of these older uh, lenses up. But um, yeah, and it's really good glass and a couple different versions uh, of glass over the, the years that have been put out by uh, Veronica and Tamron together but just solid just kind of dark horse system and um like i was saying before with the uh, the modularity of it uh, the backs uh, there's 120 220 uh there is even um 35 millimeter backs the, the wide the 135w backs they've gotten insanely expensive um over the last few years but even um the 135n is a hoot to shoot the the 35 through um the the 645 system because uh you're kind of really getting that center of the glass where the uh, the sweet spot is optically so it's just a lot of fun well you know i've got a i've got a mia 645 and a 67 i can honestly say i've shot the 645 at least 10 times more often than the 67 I mean, I, I know that there, you know, like I said, I, I, I've said it before. There's a, a bit of a cult around the, the Mamiya 67, but it's a studio camera at the end of the day, and it's not a lot of fun to just carry around the Mamiya 645. Uh, just the size is great. The, the lenses are fantastic. Uh, I've got the ultra wide lens for it, and uh, it's just a, it's a it's a blast to shoot. Um, I do have a problem with the the fact that it has um, shutter releases both on the top and the side. Uh, just because of my hand placement, when I go to wind the camera, at least once a roll, I'm going to like fire off a shot by mistake because I'll hit the other. I'll forget that it has two shutter releases and I'll hit the other one um, while I'm winding. But uh, it's a cool camera. Anthony, question. How about the Rolly SL66? We haven't talked about that. Oh, my God. Hands down, my favorite medium format SLR I've ever shot. You know, it's funny because, you know, I've got a lot of cameras and I, I'm shooting all the time. And I'm always showing my wife, Janet, the results. And that's one of the only cameras that she's like, looked at the results and said, I can tell what camera that was shot on. There's just, there was, there was something about that camera and the, and the results it produced. I'm kicking myself for not like, you know, staging a, a Florida man amputation to uh, uh, raise the money to uh, buy that camera when I had the chance. But luckily one of our camerosity listeners bought the camera from Paul and is happy happily using it to this day but yeah that camera just you know it's 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 
Got the bellows so that you can do macro with it. You can flip the lenses around. Every lens that you can mount on it, you can flip it around. It uses a macro lens. Um, just a really cool system, and it just handles very well. Well, that's the cool thing about the Bronica or the, the Rolly. Because it uses a bellows, there's hardly, and it's a it's a focal plane shutter, there's hardly any lens that you can't mount on that camera. Just get an extension tube, uh, get the shortest extension tube you can find. And then make some jury rig an adapter to stick a lens on it, and it'll focus because you've got a you've got a rack, you've got a helicoid rack to focus. So it, it'll go to infinity, it'll go close up. Uh, they're just an extremely versatile camera for a lot of different applications. So I was going to speak up and say I've had the pining for an SL sixty six since I first heard about it on your guys' show. I, for record, the only medium format SLR I've ever had shot consistently is my Mimi RB67 that I bought for a junk price and fixed up. But uh, the tilt shift mechanism on the SL66 is so fascinating to me. And it's certainly a feature that I know it's sort of gimmicky, but I really, I am kind of obsessed with um, macro photography and the, what it lets you do with macro photography with the tilt, being able to um, move your focal plane around is just so cool to me. And it makes me want one that much more. We can, that, oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Now I can say Scheimflug because that's one of the, that's one of the few cameras that allow you to do the Scheimflug effect. Scheimflug was an Austrian surveyor who uh, came up with this system of tilting a lens and doing something. And, but because of the, the you tilt the lens down and the back up or something, and uh, you can get focus from, uh, for a, from a, a few inches or a few feet, I think, on the rolly. To infinity at wide open apertures. It's the only camera, the only medium format SR you can do that with because of the movement that you just mentioned. I suspect, Andrew, the reason you do not yet have one is price. Yes, I am <laughs> a, a broke college student. Every camera that I own has been purchased broken and then repaired by me or almost yeah. everyone. The one that isn't is my Nikon FA and that's the one I shoot with the most. Well, Anthony, you, you're definitely not disappointed. It's been a lot of love for the Bronica system here, which... Um, I feel bad that I don't have more experience, just my S2, but um, I see the appeal for sure. ETRs also have interchangeable focal screens, focus screens, I should say. So like for split image or, you know, ground glass? Yeah, or yeah you can do yeah. like a like the micro prism split image or just like mm -hmm. a plain matte one. Or they have the ones that have like uh, the uh, the framing lines for the wide or the narrows in. Yeah, we had uh, Rick Olison on several episodes ago, and he talked about all the different focus screens that he makes. Not to diverge into that, but one of the things that I thought was interesting about that conversation is why you can't just take a medium format focus screen and cut it down to work on a 35 millimeter camera. I'll, I'll save you the uh, uh, haven't listened to it, but, uh, listen to it if you want to. But basically, it just has to do with how it re re redirects the light from the lens. It just doesn't work well. But anyway, all right. So we've covered Bronica. The Rolly 66. Paul, do you have any right now? Bra Rollies? Yeah, the no, SL66. No nothing no. in stock? I really should have kept that SL66X, that uh, the one that Anthony tested. He it, loved here's it. the story. I, t I traded a camera to a friend of Anthony's in Florida, and uh, Anthony t brokered the deal and took possession of the Rolly. So he shot like several rolls of film through it and absolutely fell in love with it. And then sent it to me, and I forwarded it on to a guy in Michigan who's a, a great guy, and a, a, he's, a, he's a good steward for the camera, so he loves it at this point. There is there is actually one for sale over in Indiana uh, a couple of hours away from me, and I'm thinking about going over to get it. The problem is that he only has a prism finder for it. And, uh, you know, to me, I if I wanted it, I'd really want it with a waist level, so uh, I haven't pursued the, the, the idea. Well, you may have to have accessory gas, like I clearly have now for a GS1 Speedwinder. <laughs> well, I, I, I was telling the guys it hasn't showed up yet, but I, I spent $50 on a take or a, a, a film spool, a single spool. And, and these guys are like, what? Why would you do that? But it's for the Ducati, the little half frame Italian camera that uses 35 millimeter film, but the cassettes are so small. And none of the of the two people I know that have one of those cameras, both of them were missing the spool. So I found a guy in Italy that was selling one. So I figured, well, if I have to pay 50 bucks for a spool just to be able to use the camera, I guess it's worth it since there's no other way to use it without that. So 
uh, my my latest acquisitions are, are going to be accessories. <laughs> Paul, you hand you hold held up a um, Exacta. Exacta sixty six V. So what does the V mean? Vertical. Vertical. The the other one, the other Exacta sixty six that you have is an Exacta sixty six H. Right. Mm -hmm. So they Horizontal. made them. My, mine's older. These are pre war. For a very, very, very short period of time, they did make these right after the war, but most of them switched over to the Zine Paul has, and both were uh, incredibly unreliable. And I find it interesting because I did a little bit of research on these. Even though it looks like a medium format version of a regular Exacta, the two cameras actually share quite a bit in common. Um, so I find it interesting that Ihegi did such a great job, the 35 millimeter cameras, but they just could not make the medium format cameras reliable enough. This one does technically work, but only at one shutter speed. It's got this crazy lever on the bottom. This is the film advance. So they put this huge lever on the bottom. I'll see. There you go. And I have to push it back. So I mean, if you guys, I don't know if you can see that, but it's got this mm. monstrous lever on the bottom and that's the film advance for it. So no knobs, but a, a huge lever wind. I thought the key of 60 looked like a clown camera, but that thing might give it a run for its money. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, I've never shot this before either. Like I said, it only works at one shutter speed. Paul's yours is seized up completely, right? Yes. Mm. Yeah, I thought I might send it to Alan, but I I think too much of him to do that. Because <laughs> I think he'd get into it and he'd, he'd probably start drinking and then we'd all be in trouble because he wouldn't get anything repaired. So, okay, well, I'll venture into another obscure, semi-obscure, I guess. German medium format SLR. I don't actually have one here, but I'm sure most of you guys have seen what's called the Corel Reflex. It's a six by six medium format SLR. Most of them don't work. Um, it literally looks like a standard roll film camera of the era that somebody grafted a mirror box onto, which isn't entirely wrong. But what I have here is called the Master Reflex. This is the last iteration of that camera. I think this was made in like 50, 1950, 1951 but it still has this kind of regular roll film body with just a huge mirror box just attached to it. Um, it's got a screw mount, lens mount. You still have to raise and lower the mirror with a button completely independently of the shutter release. This one actually works okay. It's a focal plane shutter. Uh, the Corels are the same way too, but I think by the time these were made, they simplified the design and, and somehow made them slightly more reliable. If, again, another option for the collectors who like some of the earlier designs, it's not that. I mean, I guess if you blur your eyes, it's about the same kind of shape as the Exacta. Here's, here's the Exacta. Here's the Meister Reflex or Master Reflex. So they kind of have that same roll film camera with a mirror box grafted on a design. The other one, Mike, that's the, the awkward camera is the uh, predecessor to the Pentax 6x7 was the Graflex Narita this <laughs> aha i didn't know you had one cool cool i had two i sold the other one to igor ah okay and i sold one to igor also did you really yeah yeah both of them worked actually the one he bought was a battle warrior it had patina everywhere it was uh it was like if you like that brass black look to it i mean it this thing probably been used regularly for decades but it, it was so smooth i kept this one because it just looks prettier um, and they both seem to work okay. So I don't know what he did with that other one. But this is a this is a beautiful camera too. Narita Kogaku made in Japan. You had mentioned Fernando uh, lens mount like the Canon. It's a breech lock. So you just hold, you just put the lens on it, line up the dots, and then you turn one ring and it's attached. So it's very fast to, to remove off, line up the dots, turn the ring, and it's back on. Have you talked about the Pentacon 6? No, mm -hmm. go for it. Very nice camera. I it's uh, the same structure as the one you have, and uh, it's a um, pretty nice camera, uh, DDR, the uh, old uh, Democratic Republic of Germany. You can have great lenses with car size. What's cool about this camera is we had Johnny Martyr on the last episode, and he was talking about range medium format cameras with a fast lens. And we were commenting that there's not as many medium format cameras with an f2.8 lens most of your best medium format cameras top out at 3.5 well this is a medium format camera and the lens is an f2 i can't think of too many medium format cameras that have an f2 lens but this oh. is right there you can see what one two it's an 80 millimeter f2 lens this is a 2.8 
car yeah. size, 120 millimeters. So that's a little bit longer. I just sold a 180 2.8 uh, Zeiss P6 lens that had the M42 adapter on it. Oh, did it? Yeah, they they made a, an adapter to adapt P6 to M42. Very rare okay. lens. Yeah. Uh, and even rarer to find with the adapter. These are uh, quite uh, cheap in, in Germany, the Pentacon 6. When we had Peggy on, she's in the UK. She was talking about cameras that are easy for her to find there, but not the rest of the world. And I suspect the Pentacon 6 is like that for you in Germany. It's fairly common, ubiquitous about, you know, because it probably was one of the few options. I doubt during that time, you probably couldn't get Narita's. You probably couldn't get Bronica's there. The Japanese cameras just weren't flowing into that country. So you were limited by what was there. And it was either the Kievs from Ukraine or it was the Pentagon cameras. Or Not that there's anything. <laughs> or the, yeah, the Hasselblads. Yeah, those were a little bit. But the, I suspect those were still pricey even then. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I think that F2 is the fastest. That, that is the, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that's the fastest lens that's out there. Even the Hasselblad uh, 2000 FC used a 2.8. I was just going to ask, is the Narita 6x6 or 6x7? 6x6. 6x6. And Miles just Miles just texted that, uh, I did miss one. The, the Mamiya 645 has an 80 millimeter 1.9. Oh yeah, you're right. I remember that. But for six by six and up, the the one on Mike's camera is is the fastest. The one nine was an excellent lens too. I mean, it was a it was a very nice lens. You've been quiet, Miles. Are you are you shooting any medium format? Uh, no, but I desperately want uh, a focal plane medium six by six for adapting lenses. That uh, the the Roly SL sixty six. You know, it's it's hard to beat that camera for uh, for the, for what it does. Yeah, I just checked uh, Harry Fleener's website, and he's not servicing that camera anymore. Right. Um, does, does anybody know anybody who services that? Alan will fix him. He will. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, I, the the one that I sold to the guy in Michigan. He was having some film advance problems, and it actually turned out he was loading it. He hadn't completely figured out how to load it, so he was getting a little overlap. So. We, uh, I talked to Alan and he says, I, yeah, I can work on them. Then it turns out it was just a loading problem and he didn't really have an issue that, that needed to be serviced. But, but uh, there are people that can repair them. I mean, basically any repairman who can, who can fix a mechanical camera, if they want to do it, they can do it. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not rocket science. The problem is the electronic cameras, not the mechanicals. Yeah. And Alan is repairing metalists, which... You know, it's the, probably the easiest, one of the easiest cameras to break on the market. Yeah. And, and I just asked him recently if he's still doing it. He said he is. I was curious if he could do the 620 to 120 conversions. And he said, no. The only one was Ken, Ken, uh, Ken, Ruth, Ruth, that, Ken Ruth. Yeah. I want to add just quickly. Um, I have repaired a lot of cameras and I recently started working on like large format lenses and whatnot. And the funny story for me is I learned a lot of the good habits for those types of old mechanical cameras by watching watch repair videos on YouTube. Just seeing someone talk through taking apart all the little gears and little mechanisms and whatnot, and kind of the good practices they talked about, like having a good work surface so no small parts get away and all that. All that applies to old mechanical cameras, and they all have very similar timekeeping mechanisms as well. And just by kind of drawing those parallels, I've been able to find that pattern and repair like graphic shutters, uh, Kodak Supermatic shutters, I've torn a Pentax K1000 apart. I've also done some electric cameras. I'm actually a computer engineering. That's the degree I'm working on. So I know quite a bit about circuits and all the electronics that go on the cameras as well. So I'm not a not a licensed repairman, but I just like to explore. Have you watched Chris Sherlock's videos? I probably have. I've gone on some pretty deep dives. Yeah. Um, Search YouTube for Chris Sherlock, like Sherlock Holmes. He was the guy down in New Zealand who did all retinas. He was the world's most highly respected Kodak retina repair guy. He did almost everything except the SLRs. No, no, I take that back. He did do the SLRs. He would not do the automatics. What was such a huge loss, in addition to him being good at repairing pretty much everything, is that he had a huge supply of spare parts, which is why yeah. he was so good at it. But he retired. He does not take on new work. But in the years after he retired, and I'll be honest with you, I have not checked in probably a year now. But for a while there, he was making some really excellent repair videos. 
Um, in fact, he did one on the Fultlander Vitessa. I didn't need to go in as deep as he did, but I needed to open it up just far enough to repair the plunger. And I literally found a video where he showed step by step how to get the camera open to get as far as I needed to go to do what I needed to do without messing anything up. And I found it to be an incredible resource. So if you want to see uh, just in general, excellent and well done camera repair videos, search for Chris Sherlock. Interesting. That's good to know. Yeah, also, uh, on Instagram, look, check out Bill Rogers. Bill Rogers is he's a Mamiya repairman. He actually yes. worked for Mamiya America as their service man. He might have been service I man. See. I got an email from a listener on my site three days ago that needed a Mamiya 645 repaired. And he contacted Bill Rogers. And Bill Rogers says he's taking a pause from accepting new work right now. He's so backed up. Wow. So he's still there. He's just, he was not accepting new work at this moment. One of the things he, he did, he's so busy doing videos. He does a video every, <laughs> every other day, it seems like, on Instagram. But uh, the biggest problem with Mamiya 645s, the most common problem, is something called a mirror stop, which is a tiny little lever that's inside the mirror chamber that when the mirror goes down, it rests on that mirror stop. They come loose. And when they come loose, they get into the shutter. There also, there's a spring attached to it. The springs get lost. The springs get down in the camera. And... Uh, it's the it's the bane of Bill's existence. I mean, he, he spends more time fishing those things out than anything else. But that that can be repaired by almost any repairman if you've got the part. If you've got the mirror stop part and the spring, there's three pieces to it. If you have those, basically any repairman can put it back on. So I have a question for the group here. For anybody who has access to at least a, a, at least a couple different medium format cameras, do you find that there's certain instances where you're going to reach for uh, the, the medium format SLR versus like a range finder or just a folding camera? Do you, is there anybody here that does both or are you guys just exclusively SLRs? I'll speak up. I have been trying to get away from my RB67 and SLRs in general. I've started off shooting just 35 millimeter SLR like a year or two ago. And uh, I my RB67, I love it because I got it for, I was making my first exposures with it for $250 by just buying as is pieces off of Fleabay. But um, I just like SLRs for the through the lens experience is very valuable to kind of my how I frame and my workflow and all that. And like I, I've played with uh, my brother's TLR, actually uh, borrowed it from him so I could CLA it. And then um, I've, I shot a roll through that. And just, there's just something about looking through the lens and seeing specifically what my frame is going to be lets me kind of at, at least with my workflow, do these impulsive little like, oh, I'll try, you know, this little experimental thing just because I like looking at it. I'm like, maybe this will work. And having that assurance of looking directly through the lens and seeing my field of view and my focal plane and all that just gives you the confidence to pretty much just experiment and try things that I would not have tried. Like it, it's, I can be much less methodical and kind of just run around and as much as it's counterintuitive, kind of take flicks with a medium format SLR. It's certainly being able to see your image, preview an image, TTL. I mean, that's that's the big deal. I worked for a long time, not a long time, but a year as a wedding photographer for these Japanese weddings, which we used Hasselblad's. And I always had a waist level finder, 45 degree waist level finder. I have a really hard time with waist level finders looking down and having the image reversed. For some reason, I, you know, I really like to frame to the edges and make everything very specific. And the reverse image, oh, it, it's really hard for me to switch it. So then I also have a Pentax 6.7 that I used quite a lot um, carrying around, but you know, that's a beast. <laughs> so it's weird and and i still haven't found like the perfect camera i have a mia 6 range binder that that um you know kind of was something but it's not quite the same as an slr and, and i mean i think i definitely lean to the slr this is conversation has been really good at, like enlightening me on some maybe new things to try um but um i don't know i prefer the larger the larger negative and for me the square negative is is really where i, I want to be at um and finding that in a in a smaller format tends to be really expensive. I think there's a little bit of irony in that if you want to shoot six by nine, you got to go with a folding camera. But if right. you want to shoot yeah. the larger bulbous, huge monstrosities, they shoot six by six or six by seven. <laughs> yeah, I have some folding cameras and I, I missed the last podcast and I listened to it the other day and it was fantastic. And I was like, ah, oh, why did I miss it? <laughs> you know, and I was just like, man, and it is, you're right. It's the same thing. You have this tiny little thing in your pocket, mm -hmm. you can fold out this massive negative and then anything else is this huge monstrosity. <laughs> Can you imagine what a six by nine SLR would sound like when it went off? 
kind of sexy, but I, you know. <laughs> a six by seven scares horses for miles around when it fires. The six by nine would be, be cough walk. There is something that will actually give you a bit of an idea. The Fuji 690, even though it's a rangefinder, has a massive clunk on it, produces big six by nine negatives, is massive. You know, someone mentioned the term clown camera before. That, that's the, the epitome of a, a uh, clown camera. But for some reason, as a rangefinder, it has a massive, massive clunk. If you want to see a clown camera, a 6x9 TLR, Google the Goland Flex. Oh, yeah. O W. Yeah, that thing is yeah. it's it's a clown. I'll call it the clown car because it's it's laughably large. Yeah, that thing's like in the realm of bespoke one or two off. It's an amazing machine, but yeah. <laughs> Peter Goland made those and he made a four by five version of it too. But they were, I mean, you had to be, that was, that was crazy. That's crazy <laughs> stuff. The, the biggest that I can remember is the 680 Fuji, which, uh, if you can imagine it, bigger than an RB, really only worked well plugged into the wall. So it was somewhat limited. Is that a focal plane shutter or a leaf shutter on those lenses? Yeah, it was leaf shutters. I had one from Kurt, and I I just didn't even know what to do with it. So I gave it to Paul. I said, here, take it. <laughs> and it took you a while to get rid of it, but you finally did. I sold it to Chuck Rubin at Rubin Photographics in uh, Louisville, and uh, he still he still hasn't completely forgiven me for it. <laughs> it was like two boxes full of stuff for a hundred bucks or something, and uh, it was it was just a disaster. That uh, GX680 has movements too, right? I forgot which. Oh yeah, it's it got does. everything. Yeah, yeah. I I've started playing four by five, and I've learned I'm a big fan of movements and. I did that that was gonna something I was gonna say. That's the one thing that I think could really draw me away from doing medium format through an SLR. I like the idea of doing medium format on a big old crowd glass and being able to compose as much as I want and kind of paint my picture there too. So I don't know, for an, for someone who's very particular and likes to paint with light, I think an SLR is the only the the furthest um as much done for me as I want. I'd say that. Yeah, I, I'm not recommending the Fuji six eighty to you, Andrew. Um, because I wouldn't do that to you, but they're so impractical that they actually sell for like reasonably cheap because nobody wants them, you know, but yeah. the, there's so many caveats to them. They're so complicated. Uh, the batteries, unless there was an AC adapter, right, Paul, for it. That, yes. Because the, they, they, they use these. You can't buy the batteries. Right. You have to power them from the wall. I mean, it's a true studio camera, but it's got every movement you could ever want. And, uh, and it's a six by eight camera. So. If you're really into, you know, like S and M and want to try something, they're at least within the realm. They're probably cheaper than the the Roly SL sixty sixes, but you they may hate yourself after you buy one, though. Yeah, I don't know. I think I have a I have a bit of a problem with big bricks because, like, I'll show off my RB six seven as I, I like to use my three D printed uh, left hand grip that I designed myself, and I have a waist level finder, and I lug it around um, and. I just have a ball with it. Actually, I bought kind of a odd piece. Uh, it was a PD prism finder for it. So it's it's a lot like a it's a lot like an RZ67 prism finder. It has like the silicon metering and a, a spot meter, average metering swap switch and all that. And I, I've started using that and it makes my camera like eight pounds and really heavy. But I just I like having everything there. Now what's the difference between the RZ67 and the RB67? The RZ67 is like the uh, electromechanical version of the RB. I, I don't know too much about it, but it's uh, okay. all I know about it is it's out of my price range. It's about a third lighter. Uh, the magazines are a little bit different, uh, though they are interchangeable. I mean, the lenses and backs and the finders, I don't think are interchangeable, but the, everything else is. But the camera is lighter. They, they took a lot of weight out of it. And it's electromagnetic. It's electromechanical. Yeah. All right. So I have one more show and tell obscure camera that still qualifies as a medium form on SLR. Uh, another KW camera, this is called the KW Pilot Super. There's also a Pilot 6. It's just a box with a hood. Uh, this one has a flip down mirror with shutter speeds from 120th through 1200th. They made these cameras actually for quite a while. Um, this one, I think, is from 1939, 1940. What's interesting is this camera is from the 30s. And I think they made it through the war. But then in the 1980s, a Chinese company made a copy of this called the Great Wall 
but it's essentially the same camera, but a Chinese company re-released it in the 80s as a medium format SLR because it's just such a simple design. But um, I like this one quite a bit, actually. I have not shot it, but I suspect it it probably works fine. And um, I think it's kind of attractive, but you know, it's got the, all the, it's got the hood. Um, this one actually has a little extinction meter. Not that I need to use it or anything, but you know, in theory, they could have advertised this in the thirties as having a meter, um, a neat little, you know, uh, exposure calculator on the side. And um, it uses regular roll film, 120 film. So yeah, I had one in my hand two weeks ago in a flea market. And I one of these? was about to buy it. <laughs> He didn't want, he didn't take it home though, huh? No. <laughs> you know, one of my favorite German camera makers was KW. They just made so many cool cameras. Uh, you know, they, they designed the, the Practina. They designed the camera that eventually became the Practica. You know, they had that patent Etui, which when you fold it up, it, it's like this thick of a camera. They had uh, so many neat little cameras. Were you going to say something, Paul? No, and I was going to say the Atui is probably the the most attractive camera from that era. I mean, those are just beautiful cameras. Uh, the The shape and design of the Atui patent was uh, was really just terrific. Mike is looking for one. I, I have one, but I it's my folding camera shelf. The problem with folding cameras is if you display them, they tend to get stuck on each other. <laughs> it's not <laughs> it's not as easy to pull one folding camera out when it's next to another folding camera than it is like an slr and and i've learned that that shelf just stay away from that area like that area the, of the collection i tend to stay away from hey earlier tom tom zoss said he he had a, a, an, an xl that was modified for a wide angle lens and i'm a wide angle lens geek so do you have it there tom can you show us what you got yes i do i pulled it out this is the xl I usually put a sports finder on it so that, I, but it isn't accurate. What's on the camera is an APO Grandagon, a rodent stock, and it's a f45 millimeter. So it gives me. It says it's a 110 degree range. Right. Okay. So that that camera is the XL with a roll film back. Right. And, and the, the sheet uh, back. The viewfinder has been lopped off, and it has <laughs> a graph lock back on it. And and I use a roll film adapter, and I've added the. Uh, hand grip and it becomes a handheld 120 degree wide wide angle camera yeah sinar had a camera called the sinar handy yeah that was they must have copied that camera because it i mean it's extremely similar but this is customized by a guy and then grimes added the lens to the body and um right so there's no focusing helicoid it's focused it's pre-focused it's so wide angle you it's Focus is almost irrelevant, you know. You're right. Just, uh, right. Air, a zone focusing, like the Holagon. Yeah. yeah, and it cool. it opens up to four point five. It's got a built-in shutter. That I bought it for a project. I've used it once, and it sits. You know, it's crazy. The whole new lens and everything. Do you have any sample images that you've shot with it? Um, I probably do, but not accessible. Email them to me or Paul. Okay. Uh, you or have I'll, sh I'll shoot guys. another roll. I. I'm in that a new too. place, so I can walk around and, you know, it's so handy. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm thinking is, I mean, I just from what, so for people who can't see this, it's, he's got basically a grip, a roll film back, and in a very, very narrow body with a yeah, shutter and a lens mounted Yeah, it's bigger than it. six by nine, you know? Right. Yeah, the, the body itself is maybe two inches thick from front to back, minus the lens, minus the shutter, minus the back. It's very thin. Almost like the Hasselblad, ah, I said it. The SWC, you know, the SWC body has almost nothing to it. That would use the Graflex RH8 backs, the the either six by nine or six by seven. That's right. I have I have all all sizes of the backs, so six uh -huh. by six by six, six by seven. That's cool. That's cool. Very cool. How how close does that? Like, what's the range of focus from close distance? Well, distance? probably better than my eyes. I got to put my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> the helicoid, I think at F. F8, it's like two and a half feet to infinity. Wow. The, the wow. lens goes to 0.5 meters. Okay. So that's, yeah. One and a half feet. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Wow. And what was the brand? APO Grandagon, a rodent stock. The body was an, a Graflex XL. Yes. Uh, they, made a, they made a version called XLS or XLW, which is the XL wide. Yep. And uh, the Graflex XL was a great camera. 
it was it was made by Singer actually, the sewing machine company people, yep. and uh, the problem with them was that they used a plastic on the lens helicoid that matched up inside another piece of plastic inside the body, and there were some little nubs that controlled the focus, and those nubs all wore off. The, the they were plastic and they just didn't hold up. So now it's very rare to find one that actually works. And the little side grip is an accessory. It's really wonderful. I also have one on my crown graphic, um, a six yeah. by nine. Very cool. And um, cool. But those are my two medium format, but they're not SLRs, of course. No, no. I will make an exception for something neat like that. And I can use the sports finder to kind of, but the thing is so wide, um, it goes way beyond the sports finder. Yeah, 120 degree angle of view is going to be the equivalent to roughly uh, 15 millimeters in 35 millimeter talk. The wide lux is 140 degrees. So, mm -hmm. I mean, granted, that's a swing lens, but the fact that you're getting almost that out of a single yeah. image, that's pretty neat. Now, is there any, do you see a lot of vignetting? Uh, not much. Uh, there is a filter available for this lens that will um, try to equalize the vignetting. Center weight, yeah. They make but, those for uh, the X-Pan. I've owned cars that cost less than that filter. <laughs> yeah. um, and there's probably a filter I could build in Photoshop to uh, offset that. Yeah. If I wanted to bother, but I've never really noticed a problem with it. On on color slide film, you would probably notice it, but on black and white or color negative film, it would be almost almost impossible to see it. Yeah, I mean, unless it's really really bad, I generally like vignetting, like j real vignetting, not like you know post processing vignetting. Like it, I think it just I don't know, it just seems more natural to me. You know, if you if you think about it, if you look straight, your peripheral vision isn't as good as what you're looking at straight ahead anyway. So kind of in a weird sort of way that that lens is doing the same thing as your eye is. You know, you can't see as clearly in the corner of your peripheral vision as you can straight ahead of you. So I don't, I don't feel like that's that big of a deal. Don't they say that a, on a 35 millimeter, a, a 50 millimeter lens approximates your field of vision? Yes. You say that. Yeah, it's actually closer to 58, but you're that's, that's as close as you're going to get is around 50 millimeters. Fernando, it looks like you're holding up an Ebner. A few minutes ago. A beautiful folder, a Bakelite. It's a Bakelite body camera called an Ebner. Kurt had one of those. Wow. Beautiful. I have the 645 version of that. I still have it. I, I don't know what happened to the Kurt, the 6x9. It's like a, it's hard to see on the Zoom call, but it's like a brown modeled Bakelite. It's, it's got like a, a, a pattern in it that's really beautiful. If you put that camera under a very bright white light, it really shows off the color in the, in the plastic. But the entire body is made of Bakelite. So as you might imagine, don't drop it. <laughs> you, it looked like you almost did there when you picked it up. That would not have been good. All right. Well, I want to kind of get to that point. Let's wind down a little here. We have lost a few people. Anthony had to drop off. Theo has an important work project. So he's coming and going. A few other people. For, for like a minute, it looked like Hong Lee had joined. I saw his face pop up for like a second and then he disappeared, never returned. So I've been keeping that in the waiting room this whole time. But... Um, I feel like we covered a lot. I mean, obviously, there's a lot we didn't cover. Um, I just don't have a ton of experience with a lot of the different uh, medium format SLRs. And it's not that I don't like them. It's just they're they're hard to to just kind of lug. They're not they're just not the kind of camera. And that, and this is really where I shoot a lot of film is I incorporate shooting in my daily activities, you know, with the kids or I'll take a camera out of my lunch break. And sometimes I'll take a camera out like today on my lunch break and I may only shoot two or three exposures because there's only so many things around my house that I could take a picture of the same thing over and over and over again. I don't travel a ton. And even when I do travel, I don't want to be carrying, you know, Golan flexes around in my bag. So I, I want to shoot the Bronicas and the Mimias and the Pentax six sevens more, but one of those in my backpack take up the same amount of space as four or five other cameras. So a lot of times they do get overlooked. And, and I've mentioned on a, on the blogging episode that my, I'm going to try and make some changes to my priorities next year and spend more time on the cameras. I actually want to shoot and less time writing reviews. So, you know, I'll talk more about that as it gets closer to the end of the year, but my production of reviews is going to start dropping off, but it's because I'm just missing out on so many cool cameras that I want to spend some time with and actually get some experience with and enjoy um, instead of just what I'm working on for the next review. So uh, I definitely am excited about that rapid winder for the Bronica. I'll make sure I get the correct one for the GS. And I hate to say this, Paul, but there's probably a good chance Kurt had one and I just didn't know what it was. 
I know I had a spare GS back. It was just the back though. I've seen some random accessories that just, I didn't understand what it was when, when I first passed through my hands, but um, I do love the idea of not only the grip, but that thumb winder seems really cool. Anybody here have any last minute questions or any cameras they forgot about that they wanted to, to share? AJ, have you bought anything yet? No, not yet. Um, although we have a big weekend coming up here at the store for uh, vintage stuff. I do once in a while take out my SQAI, but it's so freaking heavy. Yeah. <laughs> I've gotten so used to the six by nine folders and but uh, I love the camera itself. I've got about yeah. three backs for it. I got a six uh, six four five. I've got two six by uh, six sixes, and I even have a two twenty back uh, rollback. Yeah. For it. Oh, and hey AJ, happy Canadian Thanksgiving today. Uh, yes, it is. It's been yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is it in celebrating of of uh, early Canadian settlers um, incarcerating and murdering uh, uh, native <laughs> people, just like the United States is? is? Yes, more or less, exactly. It has to do. Apparently, I was I was reading it earlier this afternoon on my lunch hour uh, as I was working, but um, it has to do with the uh, the Parliament. Of, I don't know how many years back they designated it as. Uh, it's there's a whole story behind it, but uh, yeah, more or less, it's the same thing. Yeah. So I had a quick question on repair because I was just getting ready to to send my Mamiya Six out to Bill Rogers to send him a message. Um, who else deals with Mamiya rangefinders? In Spain, there is a guy, Mamiya Six, the folder folder. Uh no, the the not the folder, the um, the rangefinder. Yeah, the rangefinder. I have the six MF actually is what I have, and I think just the uh, I think the calibration is off for the focus. I would still email Bill. I know he's he's not like he's shutting down. He's just temporarily pausing so his queue doesn't get backed up. But just email him. Um, he's been on this show. I'm not going to promise you something that I don't know is true, but just mention his name came up on the podcast and you understand that he's a little backed up, but just wanted to know like when he thinks maybe he might be able to get you in or something like that. It's possible he might squeeze you in. If it's a camera that maybe he doesn't get a ton of, he might be more interested in it. You know, I know sometimes these guys who repair some of the same things over and over and over again, they, they kind of mentally need a break from the same type of camera. So uh, it's still worth contacting him over and just saying, hey, yeah. just let me know. Like if if he says, you know what, just give me to the end of the year and then send it in. He's still the guy that I think you're going to want to get. I mean, Alan, I'm sure could do it. But right. Bill Rogers specializes in that camera. No, I, I would. I agree, Mike. I'd send it to Bill. I, I yeah. mean, as much as I re respect Alan. To do the focus, you really need to have it needs to be collimated, right? And and he'll have the test equipment and the tools to do that. I thought, yeah, I follow his uh, Instagram, and 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 I think I heard about him maybe from you guys, and, and was just like, okay, this is where I gotta send it. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. no, he, he's worth he's worth waiting on to to get him to do it. Wasn't there a guy in Georgia, a place in Georgia that was doing Mamias? Uh, yes. The the problem you'll find, Will, is that they don't have the parts. Well, ah. Bill actually bought right. all the parts for me to shut down. So oh, okay. he actually has genuine parts for, for most of the cameras. And the equi right equipment to do everything. Yeah. And that's why Chris Sherlock was so respected for retinas. Uh, Mark Hama for Yashikas. There was a guy up in Michigan that bought like all the Topcon RE parts. I forget who that was. Chris, um, I remember Chris's webpage from way back. And actually he just reading his repair stuff got me into the retinas. Yeah. Um, has his parts gone on to someone else or is he, did he, he just go he through them all? He passed like, oh. on, Paul, who was the guy that we had on? He's from Portland, <laughs> Oregon. Uh, retina Rescue. No, no, no. Uh, who was the guy that he handed off the retina yeah. repair business to? Is, isn't he called Retina Rescue? Right. Mm -hmm. The guy in Washington State. It's Washington. I thought, okay. Paul, Paul, Paul Barden. That's it. Yes. Paul Barden. Paul Barden. Yes. Thanks, Miles. So you, you might want to check with him too, if you have a retina, because at one point he also stopped taking in new work. The, when word got out that Chris stopped and Paul was taking over the business, he got overwhelmed. And um, I know that he went through something that a lot of camera repair people do and that some people had over lofty expectations of what he could do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's important to remember that no matter how reputable, no matter how good of a job somebody does on a camera, these are still greater than half century old mechanical devices that wear out and you know you can't expect a camera to be flawless and i think sometimes people forget that so 
Uh, Paul Barden, I know, took over a lot from Chris Sherlock. I don't I don't know what the arrangement was for the spare parts. But generally speaking, when you hear of a guy or gal uh, that specializes in a specific kind and they have a back uh, uh, like a supply of replacement parts, those are usually the people you want to send stuff to. Whereas everybody else, you know, they may be great at what they do, but they can't replace a part if it's broken. Gotcha. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks. This is our medium format SLR episode, but I'm going to make this also our 16 millimeter SLR episode because I only have one. Uh, <laughs> this is the, the KMZ Narciss. <laughs> this is a little 16 millimeter camera. It's got an interchangeable lens mount. It's got the tiny little mount, but it's got a little reflex mirror. It's oh even got it's got an interchangeable viewfinder. You can actually pop off the viewfinder. So it's got a little waist level finder. It's essentially a normal SLR, just shrunken down to use um, 16 uh, millimeter film. And this one has an adapter where I can mount um, M39 lenses to it too. So you could put like a collapsible Elmar or any of the Fed or Zorky lenses on it too. And you could get um, different focal lengths instead of the standard which is um, 35 millimeter uh, f2.8. So it would, it would look really nice putting it in the hot shoe of an RB67. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Crap. This is heavy. Here, I'll put it, I'll put it in the viewfinder. Yeah. There. <laughs> there, can you see that? <laughs> it doesn't complete. If I take the lens off, it would completely fit in there. But yeah, I mean, look at that. <laughs> So yeah, there you go. Okay, this is officially the 16 millimeter SLR episode too. But no, great discussion. I really love seeing new people come in uh, that haven't been on the show before. Uh, Tom, it was a pleasure talking to you on the camera group last week. Uh, Henry, thank you for coming. Andrew, uh, great to see you on too. Tell your brother to come back on the show again too. Fernando, we had two uh, European callers. So I respect that you guys, it's the middle of the night for you and you could be better sleeping, but instead uh, you decide to join us. AJ, Will, Miles, you guys are, are always welcome, and I enjoy your company. Uh, Miles, has anybody contacted you that you're you're classified that we posted at the end of the last episode to, to go shooting with you? Not yet. I, I'm waiting. Yet. To see. <laughs> well, we just got it out. It, it's only been live for about a week, so maybe not enough people have heard it yet. Yeah. All right. Anybody else have anything else? I just want to say I feel like I finally am able to give back to one of my favorite podcasts by now giving you gas for all the gas you've given me. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. No worries. Oh, we I have won't... no, don't, no, don't, Brian, we have no problem with gas. No, <laughs> sure. We are, we are, we are as gaseous as everyone else. So our next episode is going to be episode 80, which is blows my mind that we're at 80 episodes of the show. But um, like we did with episode 70, we're going to devote episode 80 to cameras of the 80s. Oh. So while we have covered quite a few of the cameras from the 80s, we'll take a deep dive into maybe some underappreciated gems, recap some of the highlights. There were a ton of innovations in that decade. You know, the point and shoot autofocus was late 70s, but autofocus didn't really come into its own until the 80s. We saw... Um, you know, Canon and Minolta, you know, yeah. rebooted their lens mount and switched over to a new autofocus mount. Uh, a lot more use of plastics, the bridge cameras from the late 80s, like the Shannon Genesis and the the Rico, was it the Rico Mirai? A lot of those really bizarro cameras started to come out towards the end there, which are goofy looking, but still capable, fun cameras to shoot. Didn't the Abel come out, come out then? No, that's 90s. We're going to you're going to have to wait for episode 90 for me to rip on that one again. <laughs> I had um, Adam Paul has one and he's sending me an AI board. And I, I'm prob- I, I kind of wanted to be a surprise, but I, whatever, who cares? I'm going to re-review the AI board because I've talked so much about it. But if I have to be fair, I have not handled one of those cameras since I think 2016. So I mean, it's been eight years since I've handled one. Um, and I feel like I should revisit it and, and I'll, I will come back with an honest updated review of, is it as bad as I remember? Uh, maybe it'll be worse. Who knows? And bonus points for anybody that actually comes and talks about the 1880s, anything the that they can bring there back. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> if anyone can remember the eighties. Well, hold on, hold on. <laughs> so this is a, the replica of the Kodak. The original Sashimo, it could do whatever we like. <laughs> yeah. So the, this one is they sold these in 1988 
as replicas. And apparently every single, this red string is how it came from the factory. Apparently every single person who bought one of these left the string on and no one's ever opened them up. So this one is (laughs) non-functional though. They made it as close as possible as they could using modern parts. It even has this little string that you're supposed to pull up to cock the shutter, uh, but they are non-functional. So if you want to talk about the 1880s, that would be welcome too. But <laughs> episode, episode 80 will be dedicated to cameras of the 80s. You choose the century. Um, as always, the topics and discussions on the Camera City podcast are influenced by you guys. We welcome everybody. Don't feel like you need to be on the level of experience or collection size as us. We welcome everybody. In fact, the more of a variety of people we get on the show, the better questions, the better the discussions we have. So thank you guys all for coming and and I hope everybody has a good rest of your night. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye, everyone. We remodeled our kitchen a, while, a couple, about a month and a half ago, and um, I had to pull out the refrigerator. And on top of the refrigerator was a dark slide for some camera. It's like, I don't even know what it was to and why it's there. So I went through every camera I could think of that uses a dark slide, and none of them are missing. So I don't even know why I have a random dark slide sitting on top of my fridge. So I will be sure not to put the knob on top of the fridge. <laughs>